They said they're going to make it a digital conference. Uh, yeah, they you, better send my money back. <laughs> uh oh. Yeah, yeah. They sent they sent an email out uh within the past week. They just they sent a uh, a letter out saying that they're still going they're going to have a a digital conference and it won't be in person. Oh well, they sent me a letter saying I will do. Oh oh. I've been a life member since 1992. Oh, man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, got, I got my life membership certificate somewhere around here. I'm, I'm, like, I'm, I'm, I'm one of the senior through. life members. <clears throat> right. You know, it might be I have a folder of stuff that needs to be framed. I think it's in this folder somewhere. There's my buddy Mario. I haven't seen him in a while. Hello, hello, hello. What's up? What's up, everybody? Turn your camera on, brother. I want to see you. Uh, let's see if my hair is cut. Hold on just a second. <laughs> hold on. Let me put... Hold on just a minute. What's up, Morgan? Is that Ma Mario Gaetan? Yes, sir. What's up, brother? Lord have mercy. What's going on, sir? <laughs> What's going on, my brother? Man, oh, man, oh, man. I'm, I'm, I'm really in, the, uh, in, in, in a den of thieves tonight. <laughs> yeah. I know, what, right? What what what, what, what did Obi Wan say? You never find a more vicious hive of scum and villainy. <laughs> oh my God! Only you. <laughs> hey, look, 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 look! I'm talking about myself too. <laughs> right. <laughs> we'll have to get some more Gates barbecue when you come back down. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And you know something? <laughs> I've been wanting to go back there too. I really have. I'm 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 mad that uh the 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 Philaxis convention is not going to be in person because because that was actually on my to do list was to go over there. Okay. Nope. 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 No rush. I got you when you come down. Appreciate you. Appreciate you, Mike. I am not screening uh, people. I'm just letting them in. So just let you know. Yeah, that's yeah. fine. All right. That's fine. Can you, uh, uh brother uh, Kevin? Can you do me a favor and just keep an eye out if you see the name Quincy Gant? I'm not. Sure. He's my grandmaster. I'm not sure. Uh, I'm assuming he's coming. On here, but I'm not sure. Yeah. Thank you. We ended up with 162 registered. Oh yeah. Wow. I was gonna just do that. Well, I'll do my best to make sure that it's not uh, 62 when we're done. <laughs> it's still on. <laughs> Morgan, this is Doug Reese. How are you, sir? I'm well. How are you? Good, doing good. Can you give your grandmaster's name again, please? My grandmaster's name is Quincy Gant. G G A N T. Uh, most Firstful Prince Hall Grand Lodge of the District of Columbia. Thank you. And, and we're very particular because sometimes people call us the Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Washington, D.C. And we go, no, it's the District of Columbia. So no, you check, you District check of Columbia, man. yeah. <laughs> and we're very particular. Hey, brother sample my video showing. <laughs> there you go, buddy. Hi, Mario. Long there you long go. time to see, buddy. It's been a while. Good to see you. Good to see you all though. Indeed. You still Grand High Priest? I am. Good for you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, sir. Are you still everything? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, not quite. Kevin's always been everything. Right, I was about to say, I had to check. Hey, Byron, how you doing, brother? I'm just hanging in there. All right, all right. 
Right. Hey, James, <clears throat> James, I was telling my lodge brothers about you when you were here, uh, when, whenever that was. Uh, you wanted to visit like every library there was in the past from Leavenworth to Gates Barbecue. That's right. <laughs> That's right. And look, and, and you see the results of it. Yeah, right. Because that, that, that same trip is where uh, I was researching the book. Right, so, right. So you see the results. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Can you also still see my screen? My computer's like locking up a little bit. Um, no. No. All right, let me. Um. Yes, second. Let me make sure you're still a presenter. Yeah, I'm just gonna. Why am I not seeing you? I'm gonna, I'm gonna re, I'm just gonna jump back on. It's just easier. I'm not seeing you in the list anymore. Why is that? <laughs> I don't even see you in the participant list. I see cookies logged in. Where is she? Byron, you're logged in twice, once for audio and once for video. Nope, nope. She logged in on her laptop downstairs. I want to see her. Tell her to turn her camera on. I don't tell that woman nothing. Smart man. Stop laughing, Dale. I want to see my cookie. Byron, tell her and tell her I have spoken, as you say. That's <laughs> <laughs> what you tell us all the time. I don't sleep with y'all. <laughs> <laughs> and if I tell her something like, I don't sleep with her. <laughs> That's a wise man there. A wise man. It's very wise. Oh, hey, Alina. That's Grandmaster Hess. How are you, my friend? Doing good. Doing good. Good to see you. Oh, James, I didn't. I didn't understand if you said something. I thought I. Oh, oh hi, hi. How are you? I'm so sorry. I had to download the program right now, and I. I wasn't sure it was cutting off. I'm so sorry. Hi, how are you? It's very nice to see you. I'm very, I'm very delighted to be here and uh, hear you speak about this work that I'm familiar with um, and, uh, you know, through reading it and and, um, and knowing you. So I'm very excited about this. Awesome. Well, thank, thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm well. I'm actually, I'm actually better now that you're here because uh, I got something, I got something positive to look at. Rather, you know, you see what I'm surrounded by. <laughs> Yep, yep, yep. No, but, but all's well, all's well. Oh man, we got they're just piling in here.
Um, Mike said that he's uh, rebooting his computer. Most people have some sure if you can hear me, but uh, thank you for putting this together. Well, I certainly enjoyed your book, so I'm looking forward to the presentation. Excellent. I'm coming. I'm happy to be here. All right. Well, folks, we're experiencing a little bit of technical difficulties. We're waiting for our host to uh, sign back in. Uh, I happen to have a copy. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm back on. You can, if you can make me the presenter real quick. Thanks. My computer did a Windows 10 update. <laughs> I was getting ready to launch the uh, PowerPoint. Just either way. Either way. Um, no, I'd rather you do it because I got too, too many things going on and it's logging me down. So now if you can make me the. You are the presenter. Congratulations. We'll double your pay. <laughs> sorry, brother. If I sorry that's three or four minutes you can't get back. And when I stare at your monitor trying to reboot, it doesn't move any faster. I'm sure you're all aware. So let me share the screen here and thank you all for joining. Tonight we have 162 members who actually um, went through and registered for this evening's presentation. And I am bringing up that presentation right now. Let me give you kind of a rundown of the evening. Let me know when you can see it. Should be up here. Hey, Michael. Yeah, I, I'm not putting my camera on. That's what got me in trouble last time. So let me, you should be able to see my screen uh. here. How you got to quit showing the videos? <laughs> you can see it. You can see the PowerPoint. Yes. Okay, we're running a little bit. My apologies. A presentation instead of the slides. Yeah, I'm sure he knows how to do that. We'll just. There you go. We should be up and running now. Are we all good? All right. Thanks everyone for joining this evening. My apologies. It's those five or six minutes. You won't get back to your life there. Apology. Um, tonight I'm going to um, I'm going to introduce our speaker, but I'm going to kind of give you a quick rundown. I'm going to introduce the speaker. We're going to have the Pledge of Allegiance and then a prayer by Eric uh, by our chaplain. Uh, he will turn it over to Dale, who will talk about the Missouri Lodger research. Right after Dale is finished, um, James R. Morgan III, he will go through and present. James, when you're finished, Doug will pick it up and he will uh, ask for any questions and and do the uh, do the thank yous, etc. So thank you all for joining this evening. And I want to introduce our speaker tonight. Um, we've we've been very fortunate to have James Morgan join us. He originally was going to. Um, be at our Grand Lodge this year. So let me tell you a little, a little bit about James. So James R. Morgan III, a graduate of Howard University in Washington, D.C., where he obtained a Bachelor of Arts degree in Communications and Africana Studies in 2011. 
He is currently employed with the United States Department of State and serves as a curator or consultant with the American, African American Civil War Museum in Washington, D.C. James is active Prince Hall Freemason, and as such, he serves as Worshipful Grand Historian and Archivist of the Most Worshipful Prince Hall Grand Lodge of the District of Columbia. He's authored several scholarly writings on African American Freemasonry and fraternalism. He is also an honorary fellow and life member of the Blacks Phyllis Research Society. James is an active and experienced genealogist and member of the James Dent Walker chapter of the American Historical Society and Genealogical Society. And he was presented at the 2016 International Black Genealogy Symposium as well as the 2019 National Conference of the American African American Historical and Genealogical Society. Among others, James has served as a member of the advisory board of the Bishop Henry McNeil Turner Project and is the author, which he will present tonight, The Lost Empire, Black Freemasonry in the Old West, 1867 to 1906. So we welcome you, James, and we will pledge allegiance to the flag of our country if you will all join us. Pledge allegiance together. Everyone's muted. Okay, okay, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. I will now turn it over to our chaplain. Supreme Architect of the Universe, thank you for the time that we have to at least virtually dwell together in unity. While we know that you have all the answers, be with us as we continue to seek the answers. Be with us and our families during this time of turmoil in our country. And uh, let us open our minds to uh, what this brother has to tell us. In your name we pray, amen. So I'm gonna be. So before we get started, some ground rules. Um, everyone should be muted when they uh, enter uh, the call, and I would ask that everyone remain muted unless you want to uh, speak after the presentation or when the master calls for questions. Otherwise, I would ask you to post your questions in the chat, of which our presenter and our two moderators will uh, review and uh, call upon those people when it's an appropriate time. We have two call-in users. Um, I'm gonna keep them muted until we get to the open forum uh, question and answer session. And at that time, I will unmute everyone, um, or I'll unmute the two call-in users at least. And uh, anyone else that wishes to speak, uh, please do so by either uh, raising your hand, you can right click on your uh, or click on your name and raise your hand or type something in the chat. Otherwise, we'd ask that everyone please remain muted um, unless you're presenting uh, or till we get to the question and answer session. Thank you. I'm happy to greet everyone tonight. I'm Dale Roller, Senior Lord Ward. A lodge of research, and we have a few facts and statistics about the lodge that we want to talk about. But first of all, we want to talk about the annual membership, which is $25, unless you're out of state and it's $30. We'll take Master Mason lodges and any Masonic organization are eligible for membership. We also have something called the Denslow membership, which is $1,000. Just some of the statistics we have 24,835 people identified in our database we have 12,820 books cataloged in the library we have 580 photos 674 archive files 507 masonic objects and 800 members with 173 life members i didn't talk about a life member for 500 dollars, you can be a life member of the Missouri Lodge of Research. And uh, it has the York Rite annual returns categorized. We have 162 chapters, 76 commanders. 
we've had representatives, we've had senators, and we've had uh, Bennett, Bennett Chap Clark and Henry Frederick Nottingham was, was chapters. But I want, also want to bring in, as we're talking about this just a little bit, about we hope to start a plan here in Missouri where we go out, members from the Lodge of Research go out or teams go out, and we talk and show up in the lodges and, and present a small program that evening and work on our membership. We've got to get back to the roots of our, of our, of our being because if we don't, we've got to have members. You know, our history is both present, past, and future. And that, that at Missouri Lodge of Research, that weighs on our hearts and minds heavy. We try and keep it down. We are totally honored to have Brother Morgan here tonight to speak to us about some interesting subjects that we've been waiting in with great anticipation to hear about. We have a fine crowd here tonight and our organization is, is working forward and we're trying to do the things that we need to do and, and to present ourselves in such a matter as that we might do something where we could reach out. I want to talk just a, a little bit about the Denslow Society. We have quite a few things in the Denslow Society. If you join the Denslow Society, it is a thousand dollars, but you can join for a hundred dollars and pay it off in hundred dollar increments. The membership benefits, you get a Denslow Society lap pin, a neck ribbon, and a copy of, of Denslow's reminiscences and a membership patent. These things that you treasure and put up and, and, and keep, our library is where you can see and look at the books when you when you go to the Grand Lodge. And we want people to, to know. It's We have it cataloged where you can download it off the computer. You can read and, and study in your homes. We're trying to reach out and be a full service library and a full service research place. Um, we have quarterly newspapers, valuable Masonic information and education. And you know, as a member of the Missouri Lodge of Research, once a year, you receive a very exciting book, uh, a Masonic book of importance. Meetings and lectures and festival meals are sponsored by the Lodge of Research. You need to complete an application and join with us. We look for so many things, so many things. We also take in other libraries. And education is something that you don't just quit. You keep you keep studying and learning. And that's that's the nice thing about it. And we learn it as we grow. And we need to we need to move on and, and go farther as we can. We also hope and ask that you will take the opportunity to download an application, fill it out, and mail your money back in as the application as the application says, and come and join with us in the Missouri Lodge of Research. Become well, maybe work up to a fellow in the Lodge of Research, but become interested and looking towards our future. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> we'll now turn it over to our speaker. Welcome, Worship Brother James Morgan III. And on the slide right now, James, as you take over the um, the hosting on your end, showing you part of this book uh, that's available on his website, The Lost Empire, Black Freemasonry in the Old West, 1867 and 1906. So I am now going to take it off myself and you should be presenting now, James. Very good, very good. Uh, good evening, uh, brothers and sisters all, and I know I saw some ladies here as well. Uh, I'm very happy to be here, um, as has already been stated. My name is James R. Morgan III. I'm a proud New Jersey native, a proud member of uh, the most worshipful Prince Hall Grand Lodge of District of Columbia, where I serve as the worshipful Grand Historian and Archivist. Um, and I am a person who, at the end of the day, is very interested in our history as a American Masonic fraternity. Um, before I proceed, uh, let me thank uh, the leadership uh, of the Missouri Lodge of Research, uh, your Grand Master, uh, Most Worshipful Brother, I believe it's Cundiff is the name, is that correct? Uh, yeah, Most Worshipful Brother Barry Cundiff, thank him. I uh, also want to thank uh, Most Worshipful Brother uh, John Hess for extending this invitation, as well as my Most Worshipful Grand Master, uh, the Honorable Quincy G. Gant, who I believe is, uh, or he said, or he was coming in, I, I think he is checked in here. 
Um, so I'd like to thank you all, especially as well as brother uh, Michael Smith for making it possible uh, for me to be here with you all today. Um, the topic, uh, as has already been stated several times, is my book, The Lost Empire, Black Freemasonry in the Old West uh, from 1867 to 1906. Uh, it's a very interesting story, not just because of the content of what I was able to find in my research, but also how I came about it. Um, as I mentioned er a second ago, I am a native. Uh, I, I currently reside in the state of Maryland. Uh, I went to college and, and work in Washington, D.C., and my Masonic membership is in Washington, D.C. So the question I'm sure that's on many people's minds is, what the heck was I doing writing a book about the Old West? Um, and that's something that I'm going to explain to you all uh, momentarily here. So I'm going to jump into the presentation for the evening. Um, and if someone can help me out, can you all see the slides? Okay. Can I, can I get a yay or an a, Brother Kevin? Yep. Good. Okay. But, and you can't see the notes, right? You just see the slide. Is that correct? Yes. Yes, sir. Right. Yes, that is correct. Okay. Very good. Okay. Uh, all right. So, uh, very quick disclaimer uh, the research here presented, as well as that of the accompanying work, is in no way meant to discredit or bring undue harm to any Prince Hall Grand Lodge. Uh, rather, the information herein is presented based on upon citable primary and secondary sources to include the official proceedings of the most worshipful Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Kansas, as well as several others. Uh, it is the hope of myself, being the author and compiler of this research, that the information herein presented will help all Masonic bodies herein mentioned to rediscover lost elements of their history and correct the repeated historical inaccuracies. Uh, and I want to thank you all for your time and attention. And before I proceed, I also want to thank uh, Most Worshipful Grandmaster Malcolm Morris of the Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Missouri as well uh, for his assistance in making this event happen this evening. Um, re very quick uh, pl plug, um, I am a co-panelist on the Prince Hall um, Think Tank, which is a YouTube-based uh, show. Um, we did three episodes, uh, one in June of 2017, one in July of 2017, and then in December of 2018, where we dealt with a lot of the content uh, that you hear tonight, particularly in the December 2018 episode. Uh, as you can see there, we did a whole episode talking about the book. So if there's something that you missed or you want to go back and check this out um, a, a little further, um, you can also go on YouTube and, and look at the uh, the Prince Hall Think Tank episodes uh, that I mentioned, as well as others that we've done over the past six years. Um, and of course, nothing beats having the book yourself. So uh, if you like, if you are so inclined to uh, purchase a copy, uh, you can get it from jamesrmorgan.com. Uh, I do have a uh, a method there where you can order signed copies if you're so inclined, and I'm happy to uh, order it, sign it for you, and send it out to you. Um, so please, by all means, uh, uh, holiday season is coming, brothers, and I think it would make a great gift for uh, if you already have one, it make a great gift for any masons uh, that you know. And I know that if you're here, you probably know several. So, oh. Prince Hall and African Lodge 459. Let's start at the beginning of this story, like any good story, right? Um, just a quick recap, and I'm sure many of you know, Prince Hall uh, was made a Mason in the 1770s. Uh, there's been, traditionally, we've said 1775. More recent research has shown 1778. Uh, we won't get into that discussion tonight, but uh, long story short, Prince Hall was made a, a Freemason in the 1770s, uh, right around the time of the Revolutionary War. Um, African Lodge 459 was established with Prince Hall as the master of it, and they received a charter which was issued in 1784 from the Premier Grand Lodge of England. Uh, that charter was physically received in Boston in 1787. Okay, uh, African Lodge quickly spread from Boston where uh, Black Free American Freemasonry began uh, and spreads to first to Philadelphia, to New York, to my home state of New Jersey, eventually comes down to DC, uh, and eventually spreads throughout the country. And because of the social fabric of the time, slavery being a, the primary issue, quite obviously, right? Um, African lodges had to be more than just Masonic lodges. They had to serve as political think tanks, as places where people could uh, be groomed for communal leadership in a time when black men and women were not allowed to serve an elected office in the government of this country, right? But they still had to organize themselves, uh, particularly uh, among the free, among free blacks, right? And so 
African Lodge rose very quickly from being one single lodge in Boston, Massachusetts into a movement. And unfortunately, when Prince Hall dies in the early 1800s, there is a split that occurs um, in African American Freemasonry. Uh, to make a long story short, African Lodge 459 was established in Boston. There's a second African Lodge that's established in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Okay, we're going to focus on these two. Now, there's other lodges out there of black men, but we're going to focus on these two particularly. Uh, the one in Pennsylvania, African Lodge 459 of Pennsylvania, um, eventually has a split within it because that lodge decides to form a Grand Lodge in the year 1815, which is now known as the Most Worshipful Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Pennsylvania. But at that time, it was known as the first independent African Grand Lodge of Pennsylvania. That Grand Lodge spurs out. They start planting lodges in other places. Um, matter of fact, one of their lodges, Social Lodge Number 7, is now known as Social Lodge Number 1 and is the uh, the oldest lodge in the District of Columbia where my membership is, right? However, there are some irregular clandestine Grand Lodges that appear during this time period. One in particular is a splinter from First Independent, which is what's called the Hiram Grand Lodge of Pennsylvania. And while, while we don't have all the documentation on Hiram Grand Lodge, one thing is, has been made clear, I think, by all research that's been done into this body, is that although Hiram Grand Lodge had no legitimate Masonic authority to operate, they were very good at spreading lodges very quickly. And I, and I suspect from my own research that part of this had to do with somewhat of a generation gap. Uh, so the way that the Hiram brothers tell the story from, from uh, documents that I actually have read myself is that many of them were younger men who, who felt they weren't being listened to by some of the older generation that were in leadership in First Independent African Grand Lodge. And so you have a Grand Lodge that's legitimate, but not growing very quickly. And then you have a Grand Lodge that's illegitimate, but growing very quickly. This situation was going to become unmanageable if somebody didn't get a hold of things. And so here we see most worshipful brother John T. Hilton, who at that time was presiding as, as the head of African Lodge, uh, which was becoming a Grand Lodge in and of itself uh, in, during this period uh, in Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, eventually we picked on the name African Grand Lodge, now the Prince Hall Grand Lodge of, of, of Massachusetts. John T. Hilton had a solution for this issue. He called together all of the legitimate and illegitimate children of African Lodge, meaning the lodges in New York, New Jersey, DC, uh, DC Pennsylvania, et cetera. Uh, he said, send representatives because he wanted to iron out all these issues. Everybody did not show up, but of those that did, uh, they eventually came to a decision which forever impacted African-American Freemasonry. On June 24th, 1847, they decided to create and constitute what was known as the Most Worshipful National Grand Lodge of Free and Accepted Ancient York Masons, which is also known as the National Compact. So if you hear me say National Grand Lodge or National Compact, those terms were somewhat interchangeable. Okay, uh, this body was organized with John T. Hilton as its first Most Worshipful National Grand Master, okay? So we all should be pretty much familiar with the Masonic uh, governance structure that you see on your left. Uh, we are all, as, if, for those of us who are, who are Masons, uh, and some of us I know, I know I see some sisters of the Eastern Star here tonight. Um, for those of us who are Masons, um, we know that we are members of a subordinate lodge, which, was, which, um, which is under the jurisdiction of a Grand Lodge for our state or country or what have you, right? Well, what these brothers decided to do was they added another level of, uh, for lack of a better term, bureaucracy to their Masonic system at the time, which was you had the subordinate local lodge, then you had a state Grand Lodge, and then you had the national Grand Lodge with its own set of officers and a national Grand Master. Okay, and this was something that to this day is if you want to ever start an argument within with a bunch of, uh, of knowledgeable Prince Hall Masons, just bring up the National Grand Lodge. And I promise you, we will go to work because this is something that became uh, very polarizing even to this day. 
Um, however, I will add um, that there was a time uh, in America known as the anti-Masonic period in particular, where um, many uh, white American Freemasonry were pondering the idea of forming a national Grand Lodge. Matter of fact, at the root of American Masonic history, once America establishes its, itself as an independent and sovereign nation from England, uh, there was there were many different ideas that were thrown around, which I'm sure many of you are aware of. There was the thought of maybe we, we could have a national grand lodge. Maybe we can have uh, uh, George Washington be a grand master or the national grand master. Or, you know, these things never came to fruition. Um, and I believe that there were about 12 different attempts or, or, or times was documented where white American Freemasonry thought of doing this idea, but it never came to fruition. Um, and by white American, I mean regular, legitimate white American Freemasonry. I don't want to get into the, the weeds of that one right now. But long story short, I think that when this was done in 1847 by uh, African Americans, it was seen as a positive thing mostly, um, and as something that where they felt, hey, we 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 did this when they couldn't do it. So there was a sense of pride and dignity that came with we us forming a national grand lodge. And this is going to be very important that you understand and recognize the differences in these systems, and you'll see why as we move forward to the presentation this evening. So let's skip ahead to the origins of Prince Hall Freemasonry in Kansas. Um, the following that I'm about to read comes from uh, past Grandmaster William H. Grimshaw's Official History of Freemasonry Among Colored People in North America, um, which was originally published in 1903. Um, he stated that, quote, the first lodge in this state was Western Star Lodge Number 1, located at Lawrence in 1865, David G. Lett as most worshipful master. Shortly afterwards, Euclid Lodge number two, located at Topeka, and Mount Olive Lodge number three, located at Leavenworth, were established and chartered by the Grand Lodge of Ohio. John Jones, most worshipful Grand Master. Now, I want you to remember, he said the first lodge was established in 1865, right? By the Grand Lodge of Ohio, no less, okay? These lodges remained under the jurisdiction of Ohio until 1875, when a convention of the craft was called to meet at Masonic Hall in Lawrence, Kansas on March 7th, 1875. I'm, I'm underlining that. For the purpose of organizing a Grand Lodge of Masons. This is, this for, since 1903, what I've just read to you has been the foundational history of the understanding of, uh, of Prince Hall Freemasonry in the state of Kansas. But guess what? That slide was a lie. And so this evening, you will learn how the West was won for Prince Hall Freemasonry. Just a really quick background on the author of that statement, uh, past Grandmaster William Grimshaw was a Grand Master of the jurisdiction where I hold membership, Washington, D.C. Uh, from 1906 to 1908, he was a Civil War veteran, uh, spent much of his adult life trying to battle against uh, clandestine and irregular uh, Masonic organizations uh, in the African-American community. Uh, for a large part of his adulthood, he was uh, employed by the Library of Congress as well as the House of Representatives. Uh, he worked as a doorman in other uh, uh, positions. Uh, he wrote his official history, as I already stated, but Subsequent scholars such as Charles H. Wesley and Joseph Walks uh, have largely debunked his book as being unreliable. Um, uh, Worshipful Brother Alton G. Rountree, who's also a member of D.C., uh, so was Charles H. Wesley, by the way, uh, Grimshaw as a central figure in the propaganda campaign against the National Grand Lodge. And we're going to talk about that propaganda campaign momentarily. Um, and also, I will add as well, um, I mentioned uh, the late great Joseph Walks, who I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Uh, he was a re resident of Leavenworth for many years, but also a member of the Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Missouri for many years as well. So how did I get into this topic? Let's, let's, let's start with the real beginning of this presentation, which is that it all started with a letter. Um, in May of 2014, um, I was contacted by this beautiful lady that you see here, Ms. Denisha Swanigan, who I believe is uh, here with us this evening. Um, Ms. Swanigan contacted me on, a, gene on an, a black genealogy group on Facebook called Our Black Ancestry. Uh, she contacted me because I had, um, as a Mason, as a Masonic historian, as well as someone who's very interested in family history, 
uh, had engaged in several discussions with people about researching their fraternal and Masonic ancestors of the past and how to do it and what records to go get, et cetera. And so she contacted me with two documents. Uh, the first one, which you see uh, clipping of here, was a letter written on the letterhead from what was then known as the most worshipful Grand Lodge for Missouri and its jurisdiction, consisting of Minnesota, Iowa, Colorado, and Nebraska. Okay. Um, this document was a letter from her, one of her great uncles, uh, most worshipful, or excuse me, Brother J.J. Bruce, okay, John James Bruce, who another uncle of hers, Blanche Kelso Bruce. And for those of you who are not familiar with Blanche Kelso Bruce, Blanche K. Bruce was the first full-term senator of African descent in the United States history. He followed behind uh, Hiram Rhodes Revels, um, both of whom were, uh, were, were Prince Hall Freemasons. Uh, he followed behind uh, Brother Revels uh, in his seat representing the state of Mississippi. Revels, of course, uh, some of you Civil War buffs will know, uh, actually took over and finished out the term of none other than Jefferson Davis. Okay, um, and I don't, and I'm pretty sure that I don't have to explain who that was, who that was to anyone. Um, the letter itself didn't have any real Masonic importance in terms of the content. It was basically a, a letter to from J.J. Bruce to his brother Blanche, congratulating him on his recent wedding to his wife Josephine. Um, I had to explain to Miss Swanigan the significance of you know who we are as Masons and what does this, what do these letters mean, and all this type of stuff. You know, but beyond that, there wasn't really anything of importance for us uh, here tonight as Masonic historians. But Ms. Swanigan had another document, which was the seed for this project for this book and why I ended up here tonight. So the Cleveland, Ohio published Plain Dealer published on May the 3rd, 1869. The following I'll read to you. A Leavenworth, Kansas dispatch says, George Thomas, the Negro, who was shot by a mob on Thursday, died on Saturday afternoon. Six of the leaders are now under arrest, and the Negroes throughout the city are being disarmed by the authorities. The examination is to come off on Monday morning when startling disclosures are expected. The shooting and mob are supposed to have been instigated by a colored Masonic order in retaliation for the attempted murder of Bruce two weeks ago, who was then grand lecturer for this state, W.D. Matthews, their highest muckamuck, has just been arrested, charged with Thompson's murder. They are all in jail, and there is intense feeling over this unprecedented outrage. When I first got this document, I said, what in the heck? There was a shooting of somebody whose name was George Thompson, who we later realized was really named Alan Pinks. This was an alias, right? Um, it was instigated by the Colored Masonic Order with W. Massey. Who, who are these people? Why is the Grand Lecture being shot? I, I don't know if there's a Grand... I don't know if the Grand Lecture from Missouri is on tonight, but I hope that you're uh, <laughs> staying safe to, out there. They're shooting Grand Lecturers back in 1869 out in Kansas. What's going on, right? Um, this document was something that really, really, I couldn't sleep on it. And I went to other brothers who I thought, you know, felt were knowledgeable on um, our, our Masonic history, and nobody could really tell me about this incident. But the one thing that stood out to myself and everybody was the name W.D. Matthews, who I was familiar with and who gonna, you're going to see momentarily. Uh, it was, it was, I just couldn't sit on this. And so we had, I had to learn a little bit more about who these people were. Um, the Bruce that was shot was another uncle, yet another uncle of Miss Swanigan's family. Uh, as she calls them the, those crazy Bruces. Um, Henry Clay Bruce, yet another uncle of hers, right? Um, Henry C. Bruce was born into slavery like, uh, like the rest of his siblings. Uh, he, he escapes from slavery uh, as the war is, is going on. Uh, he, he leaves from Missouri into Kansas. Uh, becomes a grocer, an entrepreneur, uh, eventually becomes a government clerk, and he authored his own autobiography, uh, which was called uh, The New Man, 29 Years a Slave, 29 Years a Free Man. Uh, and as you will learn today, he was a very active and important uh, Freemason, um, though little, little had been known about him up until the research that I'm going to present to you here this evening. 
Now, the other person that was mentioned by name in that article, Captain William Dominic Matthews. Captain Matthews was born free uh, to his family in 1828 on the eastern shore of Maryland, not terribly far from where I live. Um, upon reaching adulthood, he traveled to Jamaica and worked as a grain merchant along the east coast of the United States. Uh, he became a Freemason uh, in Boston in 1856, according to his obituary, and he served on the Underground Railroad. Now, I was a little bit familiar with this Captain William D. Matthews. Um, because the only thing I really knew about him was that I knew he, from my work with the Civil War Museum that he was a very important Civil War veteran. Um, and I also knew that in Prince Hall Freemasonry and PHA Freemasonry, we really kind of remember him as a bad guy. But again, years ago, I didn't know all the details about his life, but I just kind of knew that he was a bad guy. That's how we remembered him. And um, I didn't really know, but I couldn't, I didn't really understand why at first. Like what, what was it about this guy? No one really wanted to talk about him in a positive light. You know, I knew that he was very active with this, with the National Grand Lodge that was going on, which, you know, that we're going to get into that uh, in a minute. Um, but I had to dig up more about him. So uh, here's what we found. Um, when he returned to Baltimore um, from his time living in Jamaica, the state of Maryland passed a law which forbid black men from owning seaworthy vessels. And so he basically was put out of business. Fortunately, he was friends with a man named Daniel Reed Anthony, who was an abolitionist. Also, the older brother, you may have heard of his, his, his younger sister, Susan, uh, Susan B. Anthony. This is her, her older brother here. Um, Dan Reed Anthony eventually leaves from Maryland and goes to, um, to Leavenworth, Kansas. He becomes the editor and owner of the Leavenworth Times newspaper. Uh, he was a member of King Solomon Lodge Number 10 under the Grand Lodge of Kansas Ancient Free and Accepted Masons. Um, and in about 1859 or so, 1858, uh, Daniel Anthony contacts William Matthews and says to him, to the you know young you know he's about twenty five at the time he says you know I think I would love it if you could come to Leavenworth I think there's nothing really for you in Baltimore you're a free young man living in a in a, in a slave state in a slave state you know um, why don't you come out here to Leavenworth Kansas and and try to make a life for yourself here at first Matthews does not want to do it and so what Daniel Anthony does is he uh, makes him an offer. He says, okay, if you will escort my wife and children here to Leavenworth, I will pay for your room and board for three months. And if you don't like it here, you can go back to Baltimore. I'll send you back. Matthews accepts the offer and likes, he ends up liking Leavenworth and he eventually decides to stay. Um, and Dan Green Anthony was a great friend to have because he eventually became the mayor of Leavenworth as well. Uh, and thankfully, because of, of, of Brother Anthony, uh, in his reporting in the Leavenworth Times newspaper, we were able to dig up much of the information that was presented in the book and that you're gonna hear here this evening. Now, as the Civil War breaks out, William D. Matthews uh, was in a prime position. As I mentioned already, he uh, was a uh, an agent on the Underground Railroad. Um, he, when the Civil War happens, he serves as the primary organizer and recruiter for the 1st Kansas Colored Volunteer Regiment. Uh, he was named the captain of Company D of that regiment. Um, this regiment was to be uh, later to be in, mustered into official service uh, and served as the 79th United States Colored Troops. This was the first regiment of so black soldiers during the Civil War to see combat. Um, it was during this period that, that William Matthews likely organized Enterprise Lodge Number no. 9 in Leavenworth, Kansas. Uh, after receiving a charter from what is today known as the Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Indiana. Now, the 79th United States Colored Troop Regiment saw some of the bloodiest battles during the Civil War, such as the Battle at Island Mound and Poison Creek. And here you see their regimental flag uh, displayed there. So uh, the different battles uh, that this regiment fought. And Captain Matthews led, led these troops to all of them. Matter of fact, uh, I believe it was at Poison Springs, if I'm not mistaken, that they lost about 700 men and won the battle against the Confederacy. So think about that. If you lose 700, but you win the battle, how many did they take? How many did they take down, right? Um, many of the men who served under Matthew's command uh, formed the foundation for the Masonic 
fraternity among black men in the state of Kansas. And I think that this is why many of them were very loyal to him, as you'll see going forward. So let's talk about how did African-American Freemasonry get to the state of Kansas. Uh, as I've already mentioned, uh, Captain William Matthews received a charter from the first man that you see here, uh, Grandmaster James Sidney Hinton, who was at that time Grandmaster of Prince Hall Masons of Indiana. Uh, James Sidney Hinton uh, also granted two more charters to the brothers in Kansas. The second lodge was named after him, James, James Sidney Hinton Lodge. Uh, and then there was a third lodge known as Mount Moriah Lodge, okay? Uh, later on, none other than Reverend Moses Dixon, who at that time was Grand Lecturer, but eventually became Grand Master himself, representing the Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Missouri. Uh, Reverend Dixon, uh, as, in his capacity as Grand Lecturer, establishes two more lodges in the state of Kansas under the jurisdiction of Missouri. Those lodges were known as Western Star Lodge and Far West Lodge, okay? Now, when this happens, Grandmaster Hinton um, writes a letter to uh, the presiding Grandmaster of Prince Hall Masons of Missouri at that time, which was uh, Henry McGee Alexander, and he basically lets him know that, you know, Missouri was invading on Indiana's territory. Missouri uh, responds to this letter. It's in their proceedings, and they basically say that they uh, felt that there were some unworthy Masons uh, in Kansas and that they didn't know what Masonic activity was going on in Kansas among black men, if any at all, they, they were doubtful. Um, but when you contextualize the fact that William Matthews, who's the head of a lot of the black masons in Kansas at this time, and many of the other men that they were fighting in the civil war, that they were, uh, that, and, and during this period, they still established three lodges. That's a, that, that is a fact. Okay. Um, you know, there may have been some miscommunication, but, and so what Missouri does is they assign Reverend and sen and future Senator, those rebels, who I mentioned uh, earlier, uh, you see him there. Uh, he was assigned as the and appointed as the district deputy grand master under Missouri for the two lodges in the state of Kansas. But he doesn't serve in that position for long because, as I mentioned, uh, or as I'm about to mention, uh, on June 24th, 1867, Captain William Matthews uh, gathers the brothers together and on, and they form the most worshipful King Solomon. Grand Lodge of Kansas with Captain Matthews as Grand Master. This Grand Lodge uh, became a subordinate, as many or mo uh, almost all the other black Grand Lodges were at this time, uh, a subordinate uh, under the National Grand Lodge or the National Compact. Uh, Henry Bruce was likely one of the original members or joined soon thereafter, okay? Uh, and we see here uh, some of the words from Captain Matthews himself. He says that four years ago, so he's right, this is from 1871, so he's back tracking, uh, he's rec recalling. Uh, four years ago in 1867, we had four subordinate lodges under the Grand Lodge of Indiana. The three lodges met in convention in due form and formed a Grand Lodge, returned their charter to the Grand Lodge of Indiana, paid all dues, etc., and their petition for a Grand Lodge was duly granted, okay? But let's, let's dig a little deeper into what was going on in the state of Kansas. Uh, among Masons at this time. And there you see Captain Matthews. Uh, this this picture, this photo is from many years later in the 1880s. Um, but let, let's hear what Captain Matthews had to say uh, in a more detailed fashion about the formation of his Grand Lodge. Uh, his 1869 address, he stated that the most worshipful King Solomon Grand Lodge for the state of Kansas was organized on June 24th, 1867 having at that time four subordinate lodges with a membership of about 70 members altogether. Having so few in number, it cost each and every one a heavy tax to establish this Grand Lodge. Therefore, when completed, it left us financially in an unhealthy condition. I be the first Grand Master at that time and looking around me, I saw that with the exception of my Grand Secretary, Brother John W. Scott, every other brother was young in the cause of masonry. And being able to assist me, even the worshipful masters, being young, were not skilled to lay out the work on the trestle board and teach the craft how to perform their duty as it should be done. Though at that time, there was much labor to be done. Seeing the condition the craft was in and the many disadvantages it had to labor under, 
I, as Grand Master, being placed at the head of the craft, issued a summons calling the craft together to meet in a lodge of instruction for every Tuesday evening. The brethren obeyed the summons and met in the lodge of instruction regularly for five or six months, and I am proud to say that in short time, through my instructions, several brethren had made suitable proficiency in the royal art to fill their several stations and superintend the craft and see they perform their labors in peace and harmony. And everything seemed moving along toward a glorious future. But it was not long before the craft met with a dreadful loss by the burning down of our hall and the destruction of everything we had, leaving us in a worse condition than we were at first. And leaving the craft without a place to meet for several months, but being determined to move forward with what money I had of my own together with the help of the brethren. In three months' time, we secured a hall, put the furniture in, called the craft together, and commenced our labors again. Now, for those of you who are into Masonic or, or research period or writing and publishing, especially books, uh, you'll learn that, or you already know that one of the things that happens when you publish something is a lot of times in history, when you're done writing it, you, you find other things. Um, and for a long time, you, you know, even after publishing this book, um, this was some of the earliest and most detailed information that I had on the foundational period of the King Solomon Grand Lodge of Kansas. Uh, but of course, after finding my book, publishing my book, I found something else, which I will share with you all here this evening. Um, when Captain Matthews talks about the burning down of their Masonic Hall in Leavenworth, um, I found an article that got into more detail about it. And that article, to, uh, to, to, to summarize, states that there was a group of Union soldiers walking through the city of Leavenworth. And as they're walking through, uh, they they find this colored Masonic hall. You know, they, they like to call it colored back then, right? Um, they find this black Masonic hall, and they were so in, enraged at the idea that black men were trying to practice Freemasonry that they began throwing rocks and things through the window. Somehow, I don't know if, if a child saw it or what, but somehow, some kind of a way, uh, someone alerted Captain Matthews and, and other brothers. And so the black Masons... Uh, go to defend their hall. And so a, a fight breaks out between these black men and these white men. Many of these men are all Union soldiers and they're Freemasons, but they're divided by this thing called color and racism. And so it's from this fight that eventually somehow, some kind of a way um, th that this hall was set on fire, whether it was intentionally or someone knocked over a candle or what, that is what ends up burning up their Masonic Lodge Hall. Um, it's a sad commentary of the origins, not only of us as American Freemasonry, but us as a nation. Um, but it's a real and honest one, right? Uh, so moving forward, here you see the Masonic lineage of the, uh, at the top, you see the Masonic lineage of the King Solomon Grand Lodge of Kansas, um, which was the descended from African Lodge through the Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Pennsylvania, through Ohio, through Indiana. At the bottom, I have placed um, the lineage of the Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Kansas, which we all know and love today, from, from African Lodge of Massachusetts to Pennsylvania to Ohio to their Grand Lodge in Kansas that exists today. But notice that I wrote 1876, not 1875, as, as we mentioned on a previous slide. And we're going to get into that in a little bit. But I want you to keep that in the back of your mind. Um, so we see here the, that, the, that King Solomon Grand Lodge originally had uh, four or five lodges, uh, Enterprise Lodge, James City Hinton Lodge, Mount Moriah, and uh, which those three came from Indiana, and then Western Star and Far West Lodges both came from Missouri. So those five lodges formed the foundation of the King Solomon Grand Lodge of Kansas, which is our focus this evening. You have two different Grand Lodges, the Solomon Grand Lodge and the Prince Hall Grand Lodge, but they have one common history, and that was one of the biggest discoveries that I made in researching this book. Um, the early activity of the King Solomon Grand Lodge of Kansas was pretty much standard for a Grand Lodge, black or white, in the 19th century. Um, many of these men were, were formerly enslaved, um, and so they learned administrative skills. Some of these men, this may have been one of the first times that they get into an organization like this at all, outside of a church, maybe. Um, and, and they're learning, some of them are learning to read. I, you know, you hear what Captain Matthew said about them being young, but dedicated to the principles of Freemasonry, right? Um, Henry Bruce was known is the first known and documented grand lecturer of this grand lodge. Um, 
And so uh, as in other parts of the country, uh, this Grand Lodge offered the newly emancipated some of their earliest opportunities at formal education uh, and administration. Um, like I said, they, they dealt with some pretty typical um, activities overall. You know, they had cornerstone laying ceremonies, banquets, funerals. Um, they established new lodges, which we'll get into in a moment, um, et cetera. Matter of fact, here you see a newspaper clipping from the Daily Kansas Tribune from June 20th, 1868, that's talking about a grand Masonic excursion that they were putting on. Where what they were going to do is that everybody was going to get on the train. They were going to go out and have a nice, you know, nice day out, you know, a barbecue, and it's all well, right? Uh, matter of fact, this document uh, I found it was very important for me because I found that Hiram Revels was listed as Grand Chaplain of the King Solomon Grand Lodge in this document. Uh, so this adds on to his Masonic resume uh, from being a member in Ohio. He was a member in Missouri, and then he was a member of King Solomon Grand Lodge of Kansas. So. Uh, there's, there's Masonic history, even on Capitol Hill, as we know here in D.C. Um, this this image here is a clipping of that same uh, document. I just want you to notice that on the bottom here, you see the media of transportation. We see Henry Bruce, and uh, we also see Emmanuel Dillard, who was his brother-in-law, actually. And we'll deal with Emmanuel Dillard momentarily, right? Uh, so there are family ties even within this Grand Lodge, which we can expect. Uh, it's not, you know, that's, that's not uh, strange or unusual, right? Um, some more early activity. Uh, one of the things that was very interesting to me about this Grand Lodge, and one of the reasons why I named the book The Lost Empire, is because uh, almost immediately after forming, William Matthews does not just limit his Masonic endeavors to the state of Kansas. He decides to expand, and this becomes a problem for him later. Um, but you see here, early on, he establishes his first lodge that he chartered himself, which was, far, which was uh, excuse me, um, oh, no, I'm, I'm sorry. This is a long slide. Uh, this, this right here is for, oh, no, this is for the first slide. I'm sorry. This is for uh, a, a banquet that the members of Far West Lodge were having, and we see this new lodge that was formed with uh, D.G. Lett Lodge, which was uh, under the mastership of Reverend David G. Lett, which was named after him, right? So this is his first lodge that he establishes, but this is within the state of Kansas in Topeka. But then following that, um, he moves beyond Kansas and establishes uh, Rocky Mountain Lodge number seven in the state of Colorado. This is the first lodge among black men uh, in the state of Colorado. So now, you know, Prince Alfred Masonry has already spread west of the Rocky Mountains with California, but now we're kind of filling in the gaps with Colorado here. And so this article, I won't read it to you, but this article dated June 4th, 1869 from uh, Levin, it's William Matthews chartering Rocky Mountain Lodge in uh, Colorado. Okay. Um, so let's go back to William Matthews 1869 Grand Master's Address uh, because I started out talking about a shooting, right? And this, then I know it's what everybody's here for. Like, okay, we're talking about uh, Black Freemasonry in the Wild West. And normally when we think of the West, a lot of us, we think about gunfights and shootings and, you know, uh, uh, showdowns at high noon. Well, well, let's talk about what happened on that fateful uh, April day when uh, Brother Henry C. Bruce was shot. And let's uh, talk about it from the perspective of Grand Master Matthews. And we're fortunate that he actually told us his perspective in his Grand Master's address. So let's hear what he has to say. He stated, quote, while the craft were moving forward, working in peace and harmony and brotherly love, with a more serious attack, which caused great confusion in the craft, as it once did in ancient times at the building of King Solomon's temple. Brethren of the mystic tie, our peace has been disturbed by two or three ruffians who conspired together to take the life of our grand lecturer, Brother H.C. Bruce. And on the night of April 17th, 1869, one of the ruffians, the notorious, false-hearted, kidnapping and Lawrence Raider, Alan Pinks, AKA George Thompson, at low 12 o'clock, hid himself at the west gate of our grand lecturer's residence and attempted to take his life by shooting him through the body with a musket ball. Then, like a cowardly ruffian, tried to make his escape by way of the east. But his sins found him out and have overtaken him, and he is now receiving his just reward for, the, for his betrayal of colored men, women, and children he has kidnapped into slavery. Also, for the part that he took with Quantrell in burning and sacking the city of Lawrence, Kansas. I will not call his name at present, 
but he is well known to the citizens of Leavenworth and walks the streets daily with the vengeance of an all-seeing eye watching his footsteps while his sins rise up before him and stare him as black as the ink that falls from the damned angel's pen. And if justice does not overtake him in this world, he will receive it in another. I wish all the attention of this grand body to the fact that we have three members belonging to our fraternity who are in prison on account of these ruffians. They are charged with crime. They are accused, but not convicted. And this grand body has no knowledge that they are guilty of the crime charged against them. We are as every good Mason should be, law-abiding citizens, loyal to our government and true to our country in which we live. Let us, like true men, spare no pains, time, nor money in seeing that justice is done them by the laws of the land. When that is done on our part, we have done our duty as men and Masons, but not until then. Oh, that's a unique grandmaster's address. I, uh, <laughs> I I know we may have some some current grandmasters or or, or, or uh, past grandmasters. What I mean, I, I, I woo, right? When I first read that, I got chills, and I get chills even reading it even now, all these years later. Um, what in the heck happened? I mean, the, the, Henry, our grand, the grand lecturer was shot. The grandmaster and some brothers went and handled it. Now you know. Now we hear what, what William Matthews had to say about it. Um, you know, what was going on? We really had to dig into the lives of these people to get an understanding of what the heck happened. Um, so let's talk about the shooting of Grand Lecturer Henry C. Bruce. As I mentioned earlier, he was a, a writer himself. Uh, he, there you see a picture of uh, of his autobiography, which you can get on uh, online, by the way. And I do encourage you to get it because it's a very unique uh, narrative of his life. He doesn't talk about Freemasonry or his Masonic career in there. He doesn't talk about his shooting in it, but it's still a very good, interesting look at from a first-hand account of what it was like to be an enslaved person and then to be a free person, uh, as the title suggests. Um, but let's talk about this shooting. So on April 17, 1869, he was shot in front of his home by Alan Pinks. Uh, Pinks was a very interesting figure to me. Um, he was a man of mixed race heritage, uh, originally from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, he ends up um, moving west into the Kansas, Missouri uh, border region. Uh, uh, and he makes a career out of um, assisting slave traders. Uh, he goes into bounty hunting. He does all type of stuff. He, he makes a career out of kidnapping uh, free, legally free black men, women, and children, as well as helping track down run uh, uh, runaways, right? Um, so you can imagine that this did not endear him to the rest of the black community. Uh, matter of fact, there was one incident uh, which we don't have to get too too much into detail on where some slave catchers actually tried to trick him and kidnap him into slavery, right? Uh, during the Civil War, he spent much of the Civil War um, in, in prison, but uh, there was part of it where he did assist, with, again, my Civil War buffs, where he did work with uh, with Quantrell, uh, with Quantrell's Raiders, which was, a, they were a, co a Confederate guerrilla force, for those who do not know, uh, operating in the Kansas, Missouri region um, uh, during the war. Okay, again, not something that would endear him to the black community, uh, and so when, when Captain Matthews talks about the raid on Lawrence, Kansas, Lawrence, Kansas was a city that was known as a haven of abolitionist activity. And it was mass. There was a massacre there during the war uh, because of Quantrell. And they, they were able to do that in part with the help of Alan Pinks. OK, uh, we found that Pinks attempted to set fire to Henry Bruce's business for some odd reason. Uh, but unbeknownst to him, Henry Bruce was uh, in the building when this happened. And so we believe that uh, it was because. Henry Bruce may have been able to identify him that Pinks um, decided to shoot him uh, to cover his tracks. And so we'll talk about in a moment why this fire may have happened. Um, but this is, this is what leads to, to his shooting. Um, something else that we note in the documentation is that not only did Henry Bruce's Masonic brothers participate in this, but there was some illusion that maybe some of his, one, at least one of his blood brothers may have actually shown up uh, for this uh, revenge shooting as well, right? Uh, so, so we had to dig into who were his brothers, okay? And what I found was that Miss Swanigan came from a Masonic family, actually. Um, here you see a clipping from Proceedings of the Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Missouri, uh, Olive Branch 15 in, in the city of Brunswick, um, where John J. Bruce, that, that same uncle that wrote that initial letter, uh, was listed as Worshipful Master. Uh, the secretary was Sandy Bruce, which was Mrs. Swanigan's 
uh, I believe great great grandfather, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, uh, there's Robert Bruce, another uh, one of her uncles there, right? So she comes from a very Masonic family, um, and they and uh, they were around such Masonic luminaries in the in of that period, such as past grandmaster Alexander Clark. Okay, um, so JJ Bruce, uh, as a, as I mentioned earlier, served as grand treasurer. Um, I won't get into de- all the details of his Masonic career, um, but he served as grand treasurer of Missouri. Um, on, on, I think on three different ten- tenures, if I'm not mistaken. Um, her direct ancestor, Sandy Bruce, actually got as high as being the Grand Junior Warden of the state of Missouri. Okay. Uh, and many of those brothers, as we mentioned, uh, were members of Olive Branch Lodge number 15. Here you see the most famous of the Bruce brothers, uh, Blanche Kelso Bruce. He was actually a member of H. McGee Alexander Lodge number three which I believe still exists uh, in Missouri, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so you have the first full-term African-American senator at Prince Hall Mason uh, in the state of Missouri, even though he represented the state of Mississippi in, 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 the, in Congress, uh, he, his Masonic membership goes back to Missouri, as far as we can document, okay? So let's talk about what happened that day and who were some of these men that aided in this shooting. Um, they, they had time to take a selfie, by the way. <laughs> um, so Wayne Matthews led this band, and, and what happened was that uh, Alan Pinks was uh, identified by a man named Henry Du Bois, uh, Henry Dubois, who, and so he's identified, he's eventually captured, uh, taken to the courthouse in Leavenworth. Uh, he can't make bail, and so the, the sh- uh, sheriff uh, was actually escorting him from the courthouse back to his holding cell when, according to the documents that we have, Captain William Matthews, along with others, such as Brother Eli, and I'm saying brother because these are these are Masons now, uh, Eli Simonton, Samuel Fields, Brother John Bland, Brother Samuel Kidd, Lafayette Collins, uh, Brother Joseph Lewis, and Brother Jackson Cunningham. Now, these are the ones that we can document. Um, they rode up on horseback, surrounded the party, and gunned down um, on pinks broad daylight in the city of Leavenworth. Um, very interesting that the uh, officer that was escorting Mr. Pinks and the others back to uh, their holding cells, he had his gun in the courthouse. Very, very interesting fact, right? you know, it, it, uh, is, that, is that a conspiracy or something? I don't know, but it's very, very curious, right? Um, now, all of the men who I named were arrested for this shooting. However, they were all acquitted between the months of May and November in 1869, uh, with the last of them being Brother Jackson Cunningham. Uh, the jury had to deliberate for 25 hours, and he was found not guilty based upon contradictory witness testimony, um, which is very interesting to me. Um, I wonder, you know, did Captain Matthews use Freemasonry um, or the fact that he had organized all these men to engage in some type of witness intimidation or something, I don't know. But it's just very interesting that from the details that we have that a lot of witnesses change their stories over time of who they saw and what they saw, right? Um, should be noted that Judge Barzillai Gray was also a Freemasonry, uh, was also a Freemason. Uh, he was the judge over the case. Uh, and I believe he had served as, as, a, as a Grand Lodge officer in the state of Utah, actually, okay? So none of these assailants were convicted. Fortunately for Henry Bruce, he survived his wounds and uh, returned to service. Uh, he also served as grand senior deacon and grand treasurer of the King Solomon Grand Lodge between 1870 and 1875. So what happened? Well, we had to go back and look at his at brother Bruce's brother-in-law, Emmanuel Dillard. Okay, and you see a newspaper clipping here from Leavenworth Times from May of 1869 which talks about Brother Dillard uh, in not so pleasing light. It says, Emmanuel Dillard, keeper of the, of the notorious Negro Saloon on the corner of Choctaw and Main Street, was arrested yesterday on a charge of complicity in the murderous assault on H.C. Bruce, his brother-in-law. The accused gave $600 cash for his appearance. Um, based on the research that we've done, um, it's, not, it's not totally conclusive, but it appears that Emmanuel Dillard who was, grand, who was grand treasurer, by the way, 
and Henry Bruce, who was Grand Lecturer. They were brother-in-laws. They were brothers in Freemasonry, but they had some private business that uh, may have went awry. And so Emmanuel Dillard you know, did what any red-blooded American would do when your brother, who, uh, who's also your brother in Freemasonry, uh, you or you think he cheats you in a, in a business deal. He hired a hitman. No, is that not what y'all do in, in, in Missouri? No? Okay. I, we don't do that in D.C. either. But <laughs> apparently in Kansas, and in the 1860s, that was the thing to do. <laughs> he hired a hitman. And so that's actually what, what occurred. Um, and so, uh, you know, in, in doing this research, it was very, very fascinating to find, to find that out. I was like, you know, my eyes were popping out of my head at this point. Um, and so were Miss Swanigan's, I think, because this was her family <laughs> that, that we were researching. Um, and so very, very curiously, um, Emmanuel Dillard dies within a year of this uh, situation. And so you see uh, a, a document of his rec a, a document of his death uh, from the following year, 1870, there as well. And you see Louisa F. Dillard as uh, administering his, his estate. Louisa Dillard is the sister of Brother Henry C. Bruce. Okay. So is it possible that some Masonic penalties or something were exacted on Brother Dillard? I don't know, but, it, you know, we don't know exactly how he died, but we know that he died within a year. So, you know, think about Captain Matthew's speech. He said, his, you know, that in all seeing I was watching this ruffian that he didn't want to name. So, you know, we, 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 I'll let your imagination go where it will. Okay. Uh, to get back to the broader story, uh, Captain Matthew's and King Solomon Grand Lodge quickly expanded from Kansas. He eventually had lodges in Nebraska, Wyoming, Colorado, Oklahoma, and Indian Territory, Texas, Arkansas, and eventually Missouri at one point. At one time, this was all uh, one part of his Grand Lodge, believe it or not, even though there was a Grand Lodge in Missouri, okay? Um, this, I think, was in no small part due to William Matthews' skills as a charismatic leader and organizer. Uh, also, the fact that we have westward expansion of the American railway system, he utilized that very thoroughly. Uh, he also was very good at organizing black men uh, or members of his jurisdiction to get help them get employment, particularly on the rail lines. Uh, there are several instances where I found where he actually uh, kind of strong armed some people and said, OK, well, you said you only want to ten black people to uh, to be employed here working this line. I think you need to hire 40. And matter of fact, if you don't want to hire them, I got about 39 of them outside right now. You know, uh, these are the kind of things that Matthews ends up getting a reputation for. And again, this is the Old West, right? So these are the kind of things that are going on, okay? Um, it, it will be noted that after the state of Missouri declared independence from the National Grand Lodge, because there becomes this, this movement to leave the National Grand Lodge beginning in Ohio, which we'll talk about in a second, that once Missouri uh, declares independence from the National Grand Lodge, King Solomon Grand Lodge plants lodges uh, in that state as well, okay? So let's talk about the Buffalo Soldiers. Um, I was very excited to find out for myself that King Solomon Grand Lodge uh, actually established the earliest documented lodge, military lodge among the Buffalo Soldiers, 9th and 10th Cavalry, which are a legendary uh, military regiment in American military history. Um, the earliest documented lodge that I'm aware of uh, among them was 10th Cavalry Military Lodge number 21, and then the second one that we know of is Cedar Bean Military Lodge number 28. And for those of you who've read the book Black Spring Compass by Joseph Walks, that what I found contradicts what he said. And the reason why is I think is because I don't I just don't think he was aware of this information at that time. If anyone's read, he has a chapter in there called The Magnificent Buffalo Soldiers, which is still very much worth reading. However, uh, we found older lodges than the ones that he talked about, right? Um, by 1869, um, Cedar Bean Military Lodge had been formed. We, we, I don't know exactly when Cedar Bean, when, um, when 10th Cavalry Lodge started, but, but I know that it was around by 1873 or before that. Uh, Cedar Bean Lodge was established right about, right around 1869. Um, and to date, um, I have documented uh, not a whole ton of, so, of individuals who are members of these lodges, but I am aware of a few. Um, I do know the name of the worshipful masters of both of these lodges. Uh, James W. Loney um, was a was the master of 10th Cavalry Military Lodge. He was originally made a mason in West Hemsfield Lodge, number 34 in Pennsylvania, believe it or not. 
And one of the great things about doing Masonic research and historic research in general is sometimes you find photos. Uh, this is a photo of a uh, worshipful brother, Elijah Earls, who was the worshipful master, the only documented worshipful master of Cedar Bean Military Lodge number 28. Okay. Um, brother Earls uh, appears to have been from Alabama. Uh, he served in the Civil War. And um, his lodge was originally based out of Jacksboro, Texas, uh, but they eventually relocated uh, from there, which was near Fort Richardson. Um, they even moved into the Indian Territory, but we lose track of them. Um, Elijah Earls was a prosperous barber in Fort Griffin in Albany, Texas. Um, and he's also, you know, a little tidbit since this is a census year. Um, in 1880, he served as the first man of African descent to serve as a census enumerator in the state of Texas. Very, very interesting factoid about him. Um, speaking of Texas, let's talk about the Lone Star State of Texas for a second, because uh, this state, which is now its own Masonic jurisdiction for both Prince Hall and non-Prince Hall Masons, right, at one time was a district under the King Solomon Grand Lodge of Kansas. And some of Captain Matthew's strongest Masonic students came from that state. And uh, you see three of them here. Okay, so we had uh, pioneers such as George T. Ruby, who was a Republican um, uh, operator and who served in the Texas uh, legislature during the Reconstruction period. He was the owner and editor of the Galveston Standard newspaper, which eventually became the official publication of the King Solomon Grand Lodge of Kansas for a time, right? Uh, he served in several Grand Lodge positions, such as the CCFC, Grand Secretary, and Grand Corresponding Secretary. Uh, he likely was a member of Galveston Lodge. Well, he was a member, excuse me, of Galveston Lodge number 25 um, and was documented as serving as senior warden, probably made it to master, but we don't know for sure. Um, of course, Wright Cuny, who you see there in the, in the center, he was once the a district deputy grand master under the King Solomon Grand Lodge. Uh, but in 1875, he's elected as the first most worshipful grand master of what is today the most worshipful Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Texas. He was a labor organizer uh, for many years. He was the undisputed head of the Texas Republican Party uh, as well. Um, very, very important figure in Texas history. And I highly encourage you to check out his biography, which, written, which was written by his daughter, uh, Maude, as well. Um, and then we also have uh, past Grand Master Richard Allen, who was a, also another Texas politician, um, member of Magnolia Lodge number 24. He served as District Deputy Grand Master under uh, Captain Matthews, and then eventually became the second Grand Master of the Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Texas. Okay, so 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 King Solomon Grand Lodge is moving along; it's very healthy, expanding out in the West. But there's a problem: Ohio rebels in 1868. Uh, the what is today the Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Ohio decides to uh, eventually split from the National Grand Lodge and start a movement for independence. Okay. Um, there had been much dissension in the 1850s between the Grand Lodge of Ohio, which was a very powerful regional body uh, in Prince Hall Freemasonry, and the National Grand Lodge. Very interesting that the National Grand Master at that time, uh, Richard Howe Gleaves, had been a Grand Master of Grand Lodge of Ohio. And they and the, once he left office there and became National Grand Master, all hell break, basically breaks loose. Um, William D. Goff, uh, who you see there, who was, who was Grand Master at the time, um, he eventually decides that they will uh, split from the National Grand Lodge. William T. Boyd, who also was a Grand Master, um, he's kind of viewed as the intellectual mastermind, and he writes many scathing, scathing uh, letters against the National Grand Lodge structure, saying it's unmasonic, um, et cetera. Okay. Um, while Boyd was Grand Master from uh, 1869 to 1875, he decides to establish Western Star Lodge number 34. Okay. So, wait a minute. There was already a Western Star Lodge in Kansas, right? Exactly. William Grimshaw miss um, what's the word I'm looking for? He he fudges the 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 history of the first lodges of Kansas. So there's Western Star Lodge number thirty four, which is established. Which by this time, um, there's some distinction within King Solomon Grand Lodge as well. David Gillette, his son Hannibal. They end up getting put out. They go to Ohio to get a charter to form Western Star Lodge number 34, which is now a rival body to the King Solomon Grand Lodge of Kansas. There's been an invasion of their territory, right? 
William H. Parham, who's also, who, who then becomes Grandmaster, succeeding Boyd, uh, he assists Henry Bruce, David Gillette, and others who decided to join this states' rights or independent Grand Lodge movement and establishes the two other lodges that form the Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Kansas. They were Euclid Lodge in Topeka and Mount Olive Lodge in Leavenworth, okay? Um, those two lodges come together and form an independent or what's now the Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Kansas in 1876, and it becomes a rival body to the King Solomon Grand Lodge, which had been there for about nine years already, okay? Uh, independence comes to Kansas in the form of Charles Henry Langston, who was originally a member of Ohio, of Ohio's jurisdiction and spreads out into Missouri and Kansas. Um, he spreads the doctrine of Grand Lodge independence from the National Grand Lodge, uh, which was at that time, and as I state here on the slide, um, Charles Langston, was actually uh, uh, a very noted Mason in that he was a past master of uh, St. Mark's Lodge Number 7 in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, he was actually the grandfather of none other than the great poet Langston Hughes, okay? Um, he later serves as deputy grandmaster and then most worshipful grandmaster of the Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Kansas, okay? And he's elected in 1880. Um, now, the formation proceedings of the Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Kansas, they actually notes, a, there's actually a very interesting note that I found where they said, quote, there is a strange coincidence in the commencement of this grand body. Our first lodge was assailed in every hand by, quote, the compact men. I cannot say Masons. That is to say that W.D. Matthews himself and some of his adherents, we are here abused, insulted, and derided on every hand. But the cause of our success is that we went steadily and attended to our own business, so that in the language of holy writ, our bow, ab our bow abode in strength, and the arms of our hands were strengthened by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. We took in men, but we took in none but the best of men, and paid no attention to what others might, might say to us. At length, the enemy thought to use more stringent means against us, and assailed us through the public press, in which I have a whole chapter on that, by the way, uh, the newspaper articles. Um, we replied by opening our mass battery and by the power of truth carried away their fortifications. Then men and masons began to see and feel our importance and our brethren began to apply for admission to our lodges so that a sufficient number of lodges were formed and obtained warrants, which lodges ad adhered to the fundamental principle that every grand lodge is a sovereign within its own jurisdiction, hence the formation of this grand lodge. Okay. So we, Matthews uh, and King Solomon Grand Lodge began to lose a lot of the original members who helped build it to the strong Masonic power that it once was, such as Ishmael Keith, who was a founder of Wilberforce University. Uh, he he uh, ends up jumping from King Solomon to the Prince Hall Grand Lodge. Uh, Reverend Thomas W. Henderson, a noted AME minister. And I know we have uh, the Grand High Priest of uh, Prince Hall Royal Archmasons here, uh, my good friend Mario Gaetan. Uh, well, Here's one of your predecessors, sir, Reverend Thomas W. Henderson. Uh, he was a very, very powerful figure uh, in spreading Royal Arch Masonry among black men in, uh, to the West and to the Rocky Mountains, uh, I found in my research, okay? Um, and there were several others. I won't, I won't get into all the details of those right now. Um, but Captain Matthews stayed true to the cause that he felt best, which was the upholding of this national Grand Lodge system uh, in spite of the efforts of others, okay? Um, David Gillette served as the first Grand Master of the Prince Hall Grand Lodge of, of Kansas, but Grand, uh, Henry Bruce eventually becomes the second Grand Master there. Um, and while he was Grand Master, he did several things. He drafted uh, the constitution of that Grand Lodge and had the original proceedings typeset, thank God, for so that us later researchers could come and read about what happened. Um, he attended uh, several, um, what is it? he attended several um, uh, conferences where they tried to work out the issues between the National Grand Lodge and the Independence, and it just it just didn't work out all that well. Um, he wrote several letters to Grand Lodges around the world, talking about the treatment of black men and Masons uh, in America, talking about lynchings and whatnot, and asking those Masonic powers to do what they could to try to put pressure on American, on white American Grand Lodges, and on the American government to stop the racist uh, genocide of black people. Okay. Um, and also uh, charters, he chartered lodges, and thankfully uh, we know that it was by his order that these Grand Lodge proceedings were 
uh, were typed so that the memory of what happened during this tumultuous period in American Freemasonry uh, could be remembered by us here tonight. So let's talk about this date discrepancy that I keep talking about. Um, the Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Kansas, uh, if you go on their website, I think even to, to this day, uh, has claimed 1875 as their date for a number of years. They didn't always do that, but they do now. Um, that is because they followed behind William Grimshaw's um, error in his writing. Um, the King Solomon Grand Lodge of Kansas, as I've already stated, existed for almost nine years before this Grand Lodge. What happens is that in 1876, when the Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Kansas is formed, William Matthews decides to incorporate the King Solomon Grand Lodge exactly one day before the formation of the Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Kansas. And so what, what uh, William Grimshaw does decades later in writing his history is that he backdates the origin of the Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Kansas to make it appear on paper that this Grand Lodge was older than the King Solomon Grand Lodge and such was not the case, okay? Um, this is what I found in my, in my research and I'm sticking to it. Um, and so uh, th it just creates a, a, a date discrepancy and aided in the historical erasure of William Matthews and Masonic history and of the history of the King Solomon Grand Lodge of Kansas, okay? And so in the proceedings of, of the Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Missouri, they talk about the King Solomon Grand Lodge drying up and members leaving, et cetera, which does happen, but not as badly as they like to try to say that it did. Um, okay, there was a propaganda campaign against them. And so I'm fortunate that my work has been able to recover a lot of this lost history of this lost Masonic empire, the King Solomon Grand Lodge of Kansas. Um, eventually, uh, William Matthews would go on. Uh, there's a split, which you can read all about in the book, between the two sides, and there's battles. And William Matthews remained true to this National Grand Lodge uh, movement and eventually became the National Grand Master of what are known today as Prince Hall Origin Masons. So I myself am a PHA, Prince Hall Affiliation. We are descended from the independent Grand Lodges. But those who decide to stay with that National Grand Lodge body and with Matthews, they are known today as Prince Hall Origin Masons. And so you see there Captain Matthews as National Grand Master, which he was elected in that office in the year 1887. Uh, William Matthews would remain um, a, a thorn in the side for, for years until his death in 1906. He remained a thorn in the side of uh, PHA Freemasonry. Um, but his story, to me, is one that shouldn't be forgotten. Uh, the story, should the story of those who, who, uh, who I also wrote about in this book, uh, because many of the issues that they dealt with then, we deal with now um, in leadership in Freemasonry. And um, uh, it's just, it was just a fascinating story to me. Um, as, as Brother Gaetan knows, uh, I came out to Kansas and Missouri uh, some years ago, back in 2017, to do research for this book. Uh, I was very uh, impressed to, to find the grave of William Matthews, uh, which you see me kneeling there. And he's also buried in the same cemetery uh, as uh, Joseph A. Walks, believe it or not. They're, they're buried in the same place. And, and I was actually preceded by Walks in that Walks wrote uh, one of the earliest histories of, of Captain Matthews uh, in the Flaxes Magazine in 1987, which was right before I was born. Um, so they're buried in the same cemetery. So you see them there um, as well. So um, with that being said, uh, thank you all for your time and attention. And I would leave you all with this thought that the history here is the history of us as Freemasons. We have fights, we have arguments, and sometimes people go their separate ways. Uh, the King Solomon Grand Lodge and the Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Kansas did not heal their wounds, but it's my hope that we can learn the lessons of the past and that we can heal the wounds of today, not only in our fraternity, but throughout this country and throughout the world. With that being said, thank you for your time and attention. Uh, again, the book is The Lost Empire, Black Freemasonry in the Old West, and it is available at jamesrmorgan.com. You can get your copy today. And like I said, if you want a signed copy, I'm happy to uh, sign them as well. There's a, uh, you'll see that on the, on the site there. But with that being said, thank you for your time and your attention. Okay, uh, this is Kevin jumping Again, I want to make sure that I know we're going to have a lot of questions um, uh, for Brother Morgan. I want to make sure that we do this uh, uh, as 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 reasonably as possible. So, for for those of you that would like to ask questions, if you would either raise your hand in the participants participants box, uh, or type your question in the chat, and then uh, we'll uh, call on you. Um, uh, to uh, to respond. Uh, 
I'm sure. Um, I see Maurice Crumpton. I'm not sure. I saw him raise his hand. Uh, let's see. I, don't I was just speaking, brothers. How are you doing tonight? Um, our uh, most illustrious Grand Master of the State of Missouri, Wayne Fryer, has a question. Wayne, go ahead and unmute yourself. Uh, yes, Mr. Morgan. Um, how much of your book covers the the uh, Quantel's Raiders when they raided uh, when they came to Leavenworth? How much your your book covers that? I, I didn't get too deep into that history, um, except as to give provide context to who Alan Pinks was, and mm -hmm. I mean, there's a photo of Quantrell in there and everything. But there, there's um, and, and there's like I, I have a um, an image of you know from the news from the Harper's Weekly of that time period. I don't get too deeply into the battle portion per okay. se, um, right? But I I dive more into who was Alan Pinks, what was his relationship to him, some these other individuals, and. You know why did why did these two shootings take place? Uh, that, I kind of dealt a little bit more with that. Okay, thank you, sir. All right, we thank have you. another question from Tanisha. Go ahead and unmute Tanisha. Uh, hang on. I'll, there you go. Hello, Brother Morgan. Hello. Thank you. For here. No problem. Just a quick question. Um, what has been some of the more negative feedback since the release of The Last Empire? And are there any retractions that you need to issue? Um, I haven't really gotten any negative um feedback at all. Um, to be honest with you, and I, and I you know, stand on the work as it is. You know, I, I won't say it's perfect in that, you know, I'm human. <laughs> right. So, as I said, I mean, I won't say there's any retractions or anything. I would say um, there's things that, that that didn't make it into the book that I found, you know, that I found later where I was like, oh, man. So, you know, where it may be, um, like I said, that article about um, the fire that happened. Um, there's things that I definitely would like to add in, maybe in like a later edition or something. But I, I wouldn't make any kind of retractions as far as the statement of the facts goes. Um, and, and I haven't really been challenged. By anybody, and this is kind of one of the things I, I'm glad that I'm in this environment where we're talking about Masonic research, right? Because one of the things that has to happen in order for someone to challenge my work, because to be honest with you, there really had not been a lot of um, publication about the King Solomon Grand Lodge of Kansas. There have been some publications, uh, one very large one in particular, about the National Grand Lodge and this battle between the two sides within Black Freemasonry, but there really hadn't been a lot of diving deep in, in writing form into William Matthews as a Freemason, okay, or into King Solomon Grand Lodge. And so in kind of doing this work, I'm not going to say I discovered every single fact in the book, but I will say that I was the first compiler of all this information and this narrative. And in order for people to challenge it, they'd have to read it. And so I'm, again, I hope everybody buys the book and reads it. And if you do find something that you find uh, interesting or questionable, I, I, I'm, I welcome it. But um, I haven't really had any, you know, uh, I, I, stay, I, I think the book has, has stood the test of time for, for this almost two years that it's been out so far. I'm very glad and proud of that. All right. We have, um, we, they're stacking up, so I'm going to go in order that I received them. First is the most notorious, uh, my brother from a different mother, Bri uh, Byron Hams. Uh, Byron, you're up next. Go ahead and unmute. Uh -oh. Yeah, that's what I say. Uh-oh. Well, right. Why are you going, uh-oh? <laughs> now, you know, as we've had conversations about Moses and, and people dealing with the National Grand Lodge sort of got left out of history. But I found out Moses Dixon was deputy grandmaster of the National Grand Lodge. But what I also found out was about the Knights of Tabor and his army. Is there any connection between what happened to that army? Brother Ham, Brother Ham you froze up. I, I think I got the gist of the question, though. You're asking about the Knights of Tabor and the Knights of Liberty and, and, and any connection between them and the King Solomon Grand Lodge? Is that what you're asking? No, between them and the Buffalo soldiers came along oh. later. Oh, okay, <laughs> you know, okay. <laughs> This um, well-trained army that came out of nowhere. 
Right, yeah. right. Um, okay, so for those who don't know what, what Brother Ham is talking about, uh, Moses Dixon, uh, he, he was an AME minister, very, very ab- uh, abolitionist, Prince Hall Mason, Grandmaster, all that. He um, was also a member of a group called the Knights of Liberty before the Civil War, which was a secret society which had as its main purpose uh, the destabilization and the ultimate ending of American slavery by any means necessary, violent or otherwise. So what Brother Hammond was talking about is the fact that they were um, clandestinely trying to uh, train you know, for a guerrilla war. And even before the Civil War started, they were like, look, we need to free our people. Um, and so Moses Dixon, uh, the way he tells the story is that uh, they had, I forget how many, how many members they had, but when the war was over, that uh, basically he was the only one left that he knew of, as far as he knew. Um, that's, that's the story he tells. He later forms uh, the Knights of Tabor as a uh, fraternity, which in their ritual and whatnot, they um, reinscribe the memory of this group, the Knights of Liberty, okay? Um, and so to answer your question about is there a connection between them and the Buffalo Soldiers, um, I'm not aware of, of a direct one, but I would say there's definitely an indirect connection in that, you know, you see the military training of these black men um, who go to Canada to do that training. And if anybody's watching, um, uh, anybody here watching The Good Lord Bird, uh, I think it's on Showtime, it's a, a series where Ethan Hawke Ethan Hawk is playing John Brown. Um, if you're not watching it, um, uh, I, I'm a big fan of Ethan Hawke's portr- uh, of his portrayal of John Brown, uh, although there's some other things with that I'm not really a fan of, but, but that part I like. Uh, there's, there's, I think it was the, the last episode from, from last week where, uh, where John Brown and there's a, a young black man who is pretending to be a black woman, a black girl um, named Onion, um, where they go to Canada. And when I thought about, when I saw the Canada scene, I was very interested because I said, wow, they went, they went there. And, that, and at that time, Canada West was an area where a lot of black runaways and, and, and abolitionists were going and they were practicing military training. It wasn't just all writing letters and everything. It was, you know, we might need to be prepared. So when the Civil War ha- does happen, Despite what some of these movies may show, many of these black men and women, uh, they come trained. They know how to fire a gun. They know how to march in formation. When they've been training for this, you know, this was the most important thing of their lives for most of them. So, um, so there's, I, there's, I say there's an indirect connection. I can't say I can't say a direct connection right now, but maybe with further research, we'll find it. Okay, we've got the next question is from Brother McClendon. Go ahead and unmute your mic and. Ask your question. Greetings, Greetings. brothers. Greetings. Can you hear? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. yes loud and clear. Oh, okay. All right, uh, brother Morgan. First, uh, that was an excellent presentation. Got to give you props on that. Thank you. Um. Oh, my first question was, um, how much, uh, if any? which I'm sure there is, of the information from Brother uh, Alton Roundtree's um, book about the compact. I can't re- remember the title about the compact. Uh, if any, did, did that influence in your uh, research for your work? Uh, and uh, it's kind of a two-part question. And the second question, uh, my mother, Grand Lodge, is uh, most worshipful Prince Hall, Grand Lodge, Arkansas. So I know that our... Um, Widow's Widow's Son Lodge, uh, number one, if memory serves me correct, um, was perhaps founded by uh, by Brother uh, Matthews. Do you have any uh, research dealing with that? Yes. So your first question, um, yes, absolutely. Brother Roundtree actually wrote the foreword for my book. Um, his his book um, definitely um, impacted my work quite a bit. In that when I became a Mason in, in 2010, it was right around the time when he decided, when he released uh, his second book, which is uh, the title is the the National Grand Lodge and Prince Hall Freemason: The Untold Truth. Um, that book is kind of the definitive to this point publication for anyone who's not familiar with it. I, I highly suggest you know recommend picking up a copy. Um, it's kind of the definitive compilation. It's almost a thousand pages. It's like it's literally a phone book. Uh, size thing, um, and he puts a, a a good chunk of the documentation of the history of that of National Grand Lodge in there. He does a little bit of writing and analysis, but a whole lot of compilation of the primary sources on this battle between this National Grand Lodge system and the Independent Grand Lodges. 
So, so yes, um, that's one of the reasons why he, why I asked him to write the forward on top of him being a Masonic mentor of mine. Um, and it, it helped provide a lot of context. And then what I was able to do, and this is, this was kind of one of the reasons, one of the ways I knew that I was on the right track, um, in doing my research, because I started to be able to go back and look at documents and arguments that people have had on this topic and things started making sense to me in a different way. And some of my friends uh, can tell you, I know, I know there's at least one or two on here now that can tell you during the period when I was writing the book, but I wasn't really telling people I was, I was telling people I was writing this book, but I wasn't giving them all the information. I started sounding different to some people. And the reason why I started sounding different was because I started being able to fill in gaps in information and said, oh, that's what they were saying. That's what they were talking about. And even in Brother Roundtree's book, there are things in there that I found where I was like, okay, Brother Roundtree, you were on the right track, but you're missing this document that I had. You're missing this fact or this information. Or you don't know about this person. And so that's one of the reasons why I was very confident as I moved forward to the process. That I, you know, I'll be honest with you. It's very scary. You know, I'm I, here I am. You know, at the time I was, 20, you know, 20, I, well, I was about 26, I think, when um, when I met Miss Swanigan. I'm 31 now. Um, you know, it was very scary to start challenging the established histories of Prince Hall Freemasonry and particularly of the Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Kansas. And I did not. I tried to do so in a respectful way, but it was very, it was a very daunting task. But once I started realizing that, you know, thankfully people like Brother Roundtree had published issues beforehand, it, it made me feel more comfortable that I was standing on a firm foundation as a historian and as a scholar. Right. Um, your second question was um, about Widow Sun Lodge in Arkansas. Um, yes, I do talk about Widow Sun. It's Widow Sun Lodge number three, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, it's Widow Sun number three. Um, that lodge was originally formed by. Uh, William D. Matthews in the King Solomon of Grand Lodge, Kansas. I found, uh, I, I have that documented and cited in the book, and I talk about them. Um, I, I think I start out the second section, of the, the third section of the book, talking about talking about that. Okay, our next question is from Sister Alina. Thank you. First of all, thank you, um, Mr. Roger Research, for inviting um, James to speak. This was just amazing as amazing as your writing is. And um, uh, my question comes from uh, my first impression, when I first started hearing about this material years ago, my first very strong impression was, this is a Morgan affair that didn't hit the public imagination or you know the, the Masonic critics out there in society, non-Masons of course, uh, because it's just ripe with, you know, it, it could have, gone in all kinds of directions with the Masonic conspirators. And, and so um, it, I think the story fell, fell obviously on the right hands. You've done it justice. And I really appreciate your matter of fact way of um, challenging, as you said, and explaining history uh, to the rest of us. It's really brave and really amazing work. And so my question is, in, in your research, have you come across any negative press towards Freemasonry. It sounds like the Mason brothers were pretty, came across pretty sympathetic here in the in the press snippets that you included. Did you, did you find any non Masonic, anti Masonic uh, press coverage of this this matter? Hmm, that's an interesting question. Um, I'll say this. I won't say that it was very. I won't say it was anti Masonic per se. But I will say that some of the coverage I found in some in certain newspapers a little bit was condescending from a racial perspective, um, not really so much a Masonic one. Um, a lot of the citation that I use, uh, as I mentioned earlier, came out of Leavenworth Times, which was ran by a Mason. So, so there really wasn't a lot of, you know, anti-Masonic feeling per se that I can recall. But there was some, not necessarily Leavenworth Times, but certain other papers, there were, there were you know, I would say, yeah, the Negro Masons are meeting. Who cares? Like, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm using today's language, but like, you know, there they were some some instances of that a little bit, but not a whole lot. Um, but I, but I do think it's interesting that you refer to it as like a Morgan affair type of thing, um, because the now, now here's the interesting thing, right? By the way, no, no relation. By the way, no, 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 no relation between me and Captain William Morgan. <laughs> by the way. Um, one of the things I think is interesting about this Hall of Freemasonry and the Morgan Affair is my stance on it right now is that I actually think the Morgan Affair was a good thing for Prince Hall of Freemasonry. 
And the reason why I say that is because in my research, I find that as the Morgan affair was negatively impacting white American Freemasonry, it really kind of gave black Freemasonry a chance to kind of formalize itself in certain ways. Like, you know, the National Grand Lodge is being formed. There's a Grand Lodge. There are Grand Lodges being formed that lead up to the National Grand Lodge. And then the other thing that I've talked about as well uh, and, and, and I'm publishing on is the idea of uh, American Masonic um, uh, supply companies are being formed during, you know, as this period is going on. And all of a sudden, you know, who are they going to sell aprons to? Who are they selling rituals to? Why is it that during this period, why is it that during the Morgan Affair period, all of a sudden you start getting print Paul Scottish Rite and Royal Lodge chapters and all this stuff? Well, because a lot of white Masons couldn't practice it. And white American um, media, et cetera, doesn't really care and doesn't really look at what black people are doing. They, they just didn't. And a lot of just still don't. Um, so I will say that. Now, one interesting thing I will say, and then I'll, I guess we'll move on, is um, the, kind of the most interesting thing I found to your, to your question, Amalena, is that um, I have found with the anti-Masonic party, they had published a newspaper, and I did find one article, uh, which is not in the book because it wasn't relevant for this, but I'm working on it for something else, um, where they actually kind of blamed Black Freemasons for helping Nat Turner. Um, they actually, it was like a letter where they warned slave owners of the South of about be, be, be conscientious of Negro Freemasons and free ministers because uh, it was some Negro Masons that assisted Nat Turner with his with his uh, slave rebellion. Um, where it got from, why they said that, I do not know, but I do, but I have it documented that they made that allegation. So I'll leave that there for right now. Okay, so, so I have a follow up to Elena's question. Um, okay. In contrast, did in doing your research, did you come across any uh, cooperation uh, between uh, the, the 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 white Freemasons and the Prince Hall Freemasons? Uh, I've, seen, no. I've seen some no, some civil not. war cooperation uh, at times. And I was just mm -hmm. curious in your research if you came across any of that. Yeah, not not officially, no. Um, outside of um, uh, the relationship that Matthew had with Daniel Reed Anthony, um, that that was, and I think that's probably a really good example of the kind of, of what cooperation I think you would see during this period, right? You're not going to see Grandmaster Smith and Grandmaster Jackson getting together and having lunch as Grandmasters. That's not going to happen in the 1800s. Um, but what you do see is kind of informal relationships. Um, Matthews and, and Anthony were friends, and, and a couple of times I found where they argued. I didn't get into that in the in the book, but um, but 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 they were friends, and um, and I do kind of think that they I do kind of find it interesting that you read that as a member of King Solomon Lodge, and then when Matthews forms his Grand Lodge, it's the King Solomon Grand Lodge. Now, was that because of his friendship? I don't know. Um, also, and, and also, so well, you know what? Let me let me take this back. Let me take it back. My, my initial answer. Let me take it back. Because, and the reason why I'm taking it back is because, as I said earlier, the fact that Daniel Anthony is even writing about or even caring about what they're doing in the King Solomon Grand Lodge, the fact that he's documenting the affairs and activities. I, I, you know, I was able to write this book. I didn't have any original proceedings of the King Solomon Grand Lodge. I had no artifacts. There's nobody alive. I mean, King Solomon Grand Lodge lasted from 1867 to about 2005. Um I don't know anybody who's a member of, who was a member of it. Um, you know, also the lodges that, you know, were in it don't exist anymore. I've only, so to date, I only know of one uh, lodge, Far West Lodge Number 5, which was an original lodge of that jurisdiction, uh, to my understanding, still exists in Kansas under the PHO banner. Um, but beyond that, you know, I was able to, to get this book done in large part because of a white mason, Recording it, <laughs> recording a lot, not all the information, but, but but a heck of a lot of information was recorded in the pages of Leavenworth Times newspaper. So, so in, in that aspect, right. and I guess I'll say yes. I, so I started out saying no, and then I'm saying yes. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you, sir. Um, Mike, uh, I don't see any more questions. Uh, so do you want to turn it over to you or Doug or? I'll turn it over to Doug. Doug, if you don't mind, that'd be great. Thank you very much, James. I have unmuted Doug. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Moore. That was a very, very good, very enlightening. I really appreciate your uh, uh, coming on. For 
John Hess for getting rolling and being started to uh, to bring you into our speakers program. Uh, thank you, most people, sir. I appreciate that. I'd also like to thank most well brother who is the most worshipful Grand Master of the Prince Hall of the District of Columbia, uh, Mr. Gant, for joining us today. Thank you, sir. I really appreciate that. Um, most of our Grand Lodge line had to leave earlier uh, due to thing, and I, as I'm looking, I think our next uh, available individual was Emmett Brighton, and I don't know if Emmett would be God, Emmett, are you still there? Up here. I do not. I do not. See uh, with that being said, uh, with that being said, a call on uh, Brother Silver for our. Most holy and glorious Lord God. I'm here. Can you hear me? Go for it. Okay. Most holy and glorious Lord God, thank you for the time we have spent in unity today. We are truly grateful for Worshipful Brother Morgan. The knowledge he has shared with us enlightens us. Uh, make us it enlightens us and makes us better men and women. We are grateful that we don't have to travel tonight, but we beg a speedy return to the need for travel. Be with our nation at this time, settle our hearts, ignite our minds, and enlighten our spirits. In thy holy name we pray, amen. Um, uh, to all of our guests, um, I am going to turn off the recording, and I'm going to keep the meeting going. So if you guys would like to chat with Brother Morgan,